thank you very much. Um, good good morning. It's um, I'm I'm in my office in Durban, South Africa. I've got my um, blinds behind me in my office uh, closed because it's still very early in the morning. And uh, but thank you for the privilege of speaking at this um, with this group, uh, this esteemed group at your academy uh, conference. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I also wish to greet uh, many of the uh, esteemed and prestigious speakers and attendees uh, of this conference um, and uh, congratulate Prof Professor Goria, who I have met when he came down to South Africa uh, many years ago uh, and um, interacted with us in Durban. I also had the pleasure of meeting um, Virginia Lynch herself when she came down to South Africa also many years ago and began training in of forensic nurses and linkages with the various people in my country. So I'm also pleased today that um, um, South Africa, my country has got very good representation. I am three persons, um, one of three who have been uh, speakers and uh, I have to greet uh, Senegal Goduma and Jeanette Sabahang of my country. So I am an independent forensic pathologist. Uh, I'm in private practice, um, but for many years I was a state or what we call a government pathologist and uh, working at the university as professor of forensic medicine. At the moment I do work uh, for various agencies, various different people, including the university. I still do a lot of teaching. I still do a lot of work for the state, for the government, for the Ministry of Justice and Ministry of Health. But I also consult and give services to um, independent uh, attorneys uh, representing clients, uh, representing individual uh, clients who may be accused, sometimes victims themselves, or may need, in fact, defense, defense of their case in court. So if I can say I, am in, I have uh, stepped into both worlds, that from the state and that from the defense, and I find it's, um, it's very important to retain a very firm and careful uh, concept of independence in my work and my opinions. Now, what I've got to say today is maybe, maybe I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, forgive me for that. Um, um, uh, and I'm hoping that you can see. Can you can you see my screen, sir? Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm hoping that there's not too many overlaps between the other South African speakers. Um, and that of mine, but I thank you for your tolerance. Now, I'm going to be very candid, uh, very candid about uh, and unreserved about the nature of the South African situation uh, and the challenges we face in this country, in South Africa, where we have been gripped by a major and long-standing prevalence of sexual and gender-based violence that has not fully been abated. Now, I'm not a sociologist or social uh, scientist, researcher, etc., and I don't want to have to go into the dynamics of what is happening in the South African situation, what is happening between the different people, and in the in the, in the South African Southern African region in this part of Africa. Um, Perhaps it is, a, it is an issue of masculine entitlement and dominance. I'm not too sure what it is. Is it male patriarchy that we're looking at? Um, something that is too well established, too firmly established in our country that contributes to this high incidence of sexual and gender-based violence. Um, 
you know, some of the aspects of uh, concern in this country include femicide. Femicide would be the, the killing of women, um, the abuse of uh, persons whose sexual and gender orientation is different from the, the common, common ones, the LGBTQI and other types of persons. Uh, human trafficking, that is a major problem in this country, including drug trafficking, and of course, sexual abuse of women. Now, the societal concern is so great in this country, and the protest from civil society is so major, that just recently, at the end of 2018, the president convened a national summit uh, a national presidential summit, summit on gender-based violence and femicide. And this produced a national strategic plan for South Africa with a 10-year outcome. In other words, between 2020 and between 2030, there was to be the following outcomes for the future that we need to try and uh, acquire and, and um, manifest and establish. And these uh, the, the, these six pillars that I've listed here are the basis and the concepts and the grounding for those outcomes. And they are as follows. One, accountability, coordination and leadership, largely from the, the persons that are in charge, from politicians, from administrators, from uh, leaders in civil society, whether academic and professional, and the coordinators of the uh, service for gender-based violence in this country. Secondly, preventing and rebuilding, preventing of, um, of violence and rebuilding social cohesion, because in the, in the 20 somewhat years beyond our transition to democracy in 1994, when Nelson Mandela largely liberated the country <coughs> from its, uh, its apartheid grip on the country, um, we needed to build social cohesion, um, uh, a reintegration of the various different people in the country. Thirdly, justice, safety, protection justice for the victim and for civil society and for anyone uh, involved, safety of the people, protection of people, response, care, support and healing, the medical movement, the clinical and medical response to, to, to violence, economic power, because it was dis, uh, discerned, it was determined that one of the problems was the suppression of women, not only in a domestic situation, but in economy out there in the world of business and work. In other words, giving, pe giving women economic power means empowering them to manage uh, the response to uh, violence um, and uh, to gender-based violence. And then of course, research and information management. Now, we have the, the, these pillars in, in, this, in this slide that has been borrowed from uh, the Department of Health itself, um, which it shows the different pillars, one, two, three, four, five, six and the issue of accountability and responsibility that integrates those pillars. In other words, you can't separate the responses. They can't separate the issue of prevention and rebuilding social cohesion, cohesion with the medical response of care, support and healing. It has to be integrated and seamlessly um, transition and fuse between each other. So, now we have some of the most progressive laws, I believe, and we, we believe laws and systems internationally. 
we have a fantastic constitution of South Africa, a progressive constitution, an all encompassing constitution. We have great laws, a great laws, and one of them would be the Sexual and Related Matters Amendment Act, which is the new law. And it's fairly recently um, refined in 2007. It's updated. It's in keeping with international developments and in law, especially relating to sexual violence. Um, it, and, and includes, for example, a gender neutral status of victim. In other words, both women and men can be raped. And that any sexual act without consent is criminalized. It provides for a whole lot of um, um, aspects about um, human trafficking, child sexual abuse, the care of the mental, mentally disabled, care of the elderly, um, violence against uh, the elderly and children, um, those that are, uh, are of a differing gender pre preference, uh, etc. It also includes things um, related to prostitution, um, pornography, um, and also the non-physical aspects of uh, gender-based violence and sexual abuse, such as sexual harassment. So there's a great amount of provision in this new legislation. And there is a duty to report, um, uh, you know, child abuse, for example, abuse of the mentally disabled. And then we have a, an amazingly new model in which, uh, in which it brings together the Department of Justice, the social department, social workers, to social service department, the Ministry of Health, the police and the prosecution together under one roof. It's called the Tutuzela Care Center. Tutuzela is a, is a indigent, um, uh, um, indigenous, sorry, uh, a title referring to the common uh, purpose of, of various arms of society. Um, in other words, um, for example, in the Tutuzela Care Center, the, cl the clinical center, it's a rape investigation and care center where it houses police, investigating officers, the various health professions, including doctors, lawyers, um, uh, forensic nurses, um, counselors, um, uh, psychologists, etc. All of them, coordinators, um, um, file managers, etc. or case managers, all in one. And there is also a dedicated court, uh, prosecutors, sexual offenses, magistrates. It's in other words, a sexual offenses court. It's a specialized court. Now, this principle, this model, the Tutuzela Kerr model, is somewhat recently started. We've got 50 of these in the country, 5 0, 50 of these, uh, but um, we're still developing more of them. And then, of course, we have several national policies, protocols, and guidelines. And we're signatory to many conventions internationally. Our South African police service has national instructions that are clearly uh, comprehensive. And the South African police service uh, also has a specialized family violence, child protection and sexual offenses unit um, in the various different metro uh, large cities the FCS units that deal with the sexual violence cases, well, um, should be dealing with uh, uh, them, but they probably are not able to manage at all. And then the Ministry of Justice as a specialized uh, SOCA unit, the Sexual Offenses and Community Affairs units in the prosecution where the specialist prosecutors and senior prosecutors um, are able to look at cases and and understand the medical evidence. And of course, I mentioned the sexual offenses court. However, with all of this in place, with all of this in place in South Africa, we have still a major challenge with implementation. 
as I mentioned, South Africa, we, we become almost known as a place with good laws and policies and principles and guidelines and legislation, but we're not able to put it all into place because we all we may have good laws, appropriate policies, all these protocols, unless there's capacity to implement it, to keep it going, to sustain, maintain it, um, it's not going to be of any help. So what are the challenges that we face? And I've listed some, there are many. Uh, I, I've, I've listed some of them that I would immediately focus on. And I mentioned one, the implementation of policies, okay, the challenge. I mentioned femicide, um, LGBTIQ or QI persons, but we also have a major challenge with DNA testing, toxicology testing. Uh, we need more specialized centers like, such as the Stutuzela Kirk Center, and we need a lot of training, a lot of training. There's a new need for training. Let's look at policy implementation. I've mentioned that. And the reasons for the lack of implementation is considered to be possible political interference in executive functions of ministries, amongst other things, political interference. There are just so many political uh, views and political parties. We've just had local government municipal elections just three or four days ago. And we can see that, that that in the number of political parties, the number of differing views, in the number of opposing views. And so therefore, it affects the implementation of policy because the policy makers themselves are of different views about it. And then, of course, the challenges of restoring governance, law and order in a country that's still struggling in its early years, although it's gone 20 something years. It's still early years as we're striving to mature into a full democracy. There is a great amount of, there has been, and still is, a great amount of expectation from the general public, and that is not being met and not being realized. And therefore, there's a tremendous amount of frustration, frustration amongst the common folk. For example, with unemployment or uh, adequate housing or uh, supplies, domestic supplies and services such as water and sanitation. Now, femicide is something that has gripped the country recently uh, over the last few years. Uh, it's really made, in fact, <coughs> femicide is one of the reasons that the president created and, and ha held this um, presidential summit. And this young woman at the, uh, at the ex uh, left um, uh, it was one of the high profile cases in which she was lured at a bank by a, a, a male and she was um, kidnapped and uh, and of course killed, possibly raped and killed. These other young women were also, I won't mention the names, it doesn't come to me immediately, but they were also fairly high profile cases of young women who were killed. Um, so, um, and then the, the issue of LGBTIQ plus persons, it's, it's, it's a major concern for the human rights community, for, for uh, the health service, because a lot of the persons who have different gender preferences have been targeted, targeted uh, because of these preferences. And what happens is, for example, this is really serious. And what I and in fact, I've examined a few cases and attended and dealt with a few matters where a person of a different gender, such a uh, gender preference, such as a lesbian, is raped, sexually abused and raped, 
as a form of corrective action, corrective action. In other words, to correct their gender preference. I mean, how, how horrible is that? How debased is that um, to have such a thing um, um, happening in, in a society like today? And then of course we have a major challenge with DNA testing in our country. Now DNA, I won't go into that. Uh, we know its value. In fact, in this country, we've got a DNA database of convicted persons. We've started a DNA database. There's an oversight ministerial committee that's overseeing the, the database and DNA testing, but they cannot seem to get their heads, uh, wrap their hands around the problem of a major backlog, a major backlog in testing. Um, it has been said in August this year, that was uh, three months ago, that there were greater than possibly about quarter of a million sexually, sexual offenses, crime kits that are remaining in a laboratory storeroom untested and not yet tested because there's no capacity. Whether the capacity is laboratory facilities, whether it's budget, whether it's the cost of laboratory reagents, whether it's um, uh, personnel, professional personnel, um, or whether just the numbers have just over, overwhelmed the service, it, it's a combination of all of it, a massive backlog. And it is estimated that it will be, for that quarter of a million, it will be at least two to three years before the backlog itself is going to be addressed, let alone dealing with the daily, daily streaming in of new cases. So in other words, the system, the backlog has to be dealt with in two ways. Deal with the backlog and deal with the continuous streaming in of current cases. And then we have an even greater challenge with toxicology testing. Um, there's a great amount, a massive, an even greater backlog of toxicology specimens sitting in our forensic health chemistry laboratory, um, not tested because there's just no capacity, no budget, not enough storeroom space, not enough laboratory capacity, not enough staff, not toxicology and analysts, not enough reagents, etc. And one colleague of mine estimated that the downtime in testing and, and yielding of results in toxicology cases which emanate mainly from the post-mortem examinations, but also from other forensic cases, will probably take close to a decade before we were able to get to grips with it. Uh, the question is, will we ever get to grips with the number of cases being delayed? There are unidentified bodies, for example, remaining in state mortuaries for months and years, waiting for DNA testing to be able to establish the identity before they can be released to the families for burial. Imagine a family waiting one to two years for the body in order to bury. There's no closure for it. Now, uh, the, the, the other challenge is that, and I mentioned the Tutazela Kerr Center, and I mentioned what it is. It's a place where the police Law, the lawyers from the Department of uh, Justice and the National Prosecution Service, uh, the Department of Health, social workers and counselors from the social, Department of Social Services all get together, and of course, voluntary organizations all get together and they work in one center full time. Uh, uh, the, there's this group at the bottom, for example, is a group of nurses only in the center and dealing with sexual offenses victim. It's a one-stop center. That's what they call it, a one-stop center. Now we need more of these. There's 50 or so that we've, we've got at the moment, five zero in the country. 
it's just not enough. In fact, it's estimated that all of these 50 centers only deal with about 5% of the sexual violence cases. The rest of the 95% of cases are dealt with at places where there's no trained personnel and no committed facility, no dedicated service area. There may be a crisis clinic in the hospital or a emergency clinic, but it's just dealt with in any clinic facility. So um, there's a great need. It's, it's a great model. It's a great system, but it's a great need to find um, more of this, to establish more of these in the country. Um, at the moment, you can see this is the country, South Africa, and I'm here around here in Durban, that's Cape Town on the left, lower left, and the biggest, biggest city of Johannesburg in the most densely populated area. Each flag represents one, just one of the Tutuzela care centers. So it's, a, it, it's really working well. It can work well. I just hope we can maintain it and create many more like these. Then the last uh, that I'd like to focus on is training, training and training. There's a great amount of training. South Africa is still a young democracy. There's a lot of young students and trainees. Um, there's a great amount of training that's needed, especially in implementing these new laws and policies, okay, to staff these new centers, okay, and training not only just for the doctors, the medical examiners. We found that, unfortunately, the lack of adequate, updated, appropriate current training has left doctors with outdated ideas and concepts that need to be re recharged within them. So in other words, and, and of course, the evidence that forensic medical doctors, medical examiners were, were giving, giving in court was defective. Then we have the concept of the forensic nurse examiners we recently embraced, nurse examiners, and though that, that is an area of urgent training, because if we have new people, unless we train them afresh, right at the beginning and train appropriately, we're going to not be able to catch up with the backlog of training uh, interventions. So we should be starting the training now. We believe they, uh, with training of nurse examiners, it will be facilitated by the fact that our nursing council in South Africa has embraced and accepted the idea of the forensic nurse nursing specialist. They've created the uh, training outcomes or the, uh, the stand, training standards, and we need to um, get that into place. Similarly, lawyers tra need training, continuous training, and police officers. Um, but I lastly just want to quickly finish off by just talking about something that happened in our least recent lockdown, something that we noted. Look, we always rec recognize that. Excuse me, Dr. Steve, please be fast. Pardon? Please be fast. You have already exhausted you. your time. Thank you very much. Okay, I certainly will. Well, the last thing is that alcohol and drug facilitated rape drastically dropped during lockdown. When alcohol sales were prohibited, drug facilitated rape and sexual abuse in general dropped, but picked up again in, on the easing of restrictions. Now, the problem is that there's no drug testing capacity in the state forensic laboratories at the moment. And I fear that defense lawyers representing accused persons in sexual abuse cases are benefiting from this gap in the system and where the prosecution and the victim is denied the ability to use drug testing to strengthen the case uh, against the